Bible says, He hath put my brethren far from me. Mine acquaintance are very estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in mine house and my maids count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I called my servant, and he gave me no answer. I treat him with my mouth. My breath is strange to my wife, though I entreated for the children's sake of my own body. Yea, young children despised me. I arose, and they spake against me. All my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved are turned against me. My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do ye persecute me as God, and are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, Yet in my flesh I shall see God, or shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Let's pray, Father in heaven, as we've given attention now, I pray you give us understanding, and I pray the Holy Spirit will do it with us, illuminate, and Lord, I know you don't have to have me, but I've got to have thee, I pray that you would help us. As Paul said, I came not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost. And I ask today that it would be that kind of a message from heaven in Jesus' beautiful, precious name. Amen. You may be seated. And Job has been through it. I want you to put some of this thought together. Now, understand that when Job went through his trials, it was not because of his sinfulness. Now, he was a sinner just like you and me. He had one moment with his friend says, how can a man be justified with God? He's saying, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but I will submit to you, as we learned in the book of Job at the beginning, nobody in the area walked as close to God as Job did. Job loved the Lord with all his heart. He was a family man. He walked with God. He was a just man. He was a man of integrity. That means that his whole being was right. Look, he wasn't a faker. He was who he was. Who he said he was, he was. He was true to the Lord. The devil shows up on that appointed day when the devil showed up and God was dealing with the angels and God says, uh, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, I know Job. And I'm paraphrasing the devil. He said, I know Job. Job only loves you because of your blessings. If you take all that away from you, uh, from him, I mean, he's not a man of integrity. He's a faker. He'll curse you and die. He really doesn't love you because of you. He just loves you because of all the good things you've given him. And the Lord says, you can do it. Just don't take his life. And what did the devil do? He put that big question mark. Wanted Job to think God was attacking him. What did the devil use? Does anybody remember he used what? Nature. Is that something that nature cannot be the hand of God, but actually could be the allowance, the power of the devil? A fire came, destroyed his livestock. That was the devil. A whirlwind came like a hurricane in a sense, but no ocean. A whirlwind came like a tornado you can might think of. Lifted up his house, landed it on his children. He lost the lives of his children. It was the act of the devil over nature. And the servants came. He lost his money. He lost his children. He lost his servants. And then what else? His body. Job would not curse the Lord. He blessed the Lord. What amazing way to 
turn out on that. And then the devil said, I know what I'll do. I'm going to take his body. And he gave him sickness from the bottom to the top. Job did not curse God. Even in that, his wife comes up to him. I believe his wife loved him. She was going through awful tragedy herself, losing her children, and she became a playground for the devil. And I believe the devil influenced her, and she said, Job, look at all your trouble. Look at all your pain. Do you really think God, I'm paraphrasing what she's saying to him, do you really think God loves you? Look what he's done to you. Curse God and die. And she actually said that phrase. And he said, you talk like a foolish woman. I'm not going to curse God. Can we, if we're going to receive good, should we not be able to receive evil from the Lord, which meant trouble? And uh, Job kept his integrity. He would not curse God. Now, I remind you, he cursed the day of his birth. And I've said many times in this, these messages of Job, you might find somebody that curses the day of their birth, but they don't curse the day of their second birth. Job never cursed the fact that God was his God. Though he was troubled by the hard life he'd been going through. Now let me ask you a question. When his friends show up, I want to pull that to you so we can understand this message today. When his friends show up in chapter number 3, the Bible says in verse number 10, when he speaks to his wife, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the first women speaketh. What shall we receive? Go at the hand of God, not, shall we receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Verse 11, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came everyone from his own place. Let me ask you a question. Do you think some time has elapsed between them hearing and showing up? Absolutely. Is time, has time taken some toll? Yes. How do you think Job is feeling when his friends show up? We don't know the specific amount of time, but they heard they lived a ways off. It took a while to hear. Then they had to make a decision, let's all gather up together, goods, we're going on a trip, kiss honeys goodbye, go out the door, and get to Job's house. Let me tell you something, Job is in a mess. He's wanting some comfort. I bet I, there's been nights him and his wife weren't speaking. Nights where the servants weren't listening to him. People in the area were making fun of him. Children, as we read, uh, made fun of him and mocked him as he either went about day-by-day -day business. Probably when Job would walk in the community between this time of this tragedy to the time of the friends showing up, could you imagine he would walk into town, you could see on his face the hardness. He said in the previous passage that we preached on, remember, he had wrinkles on his face. The suffering Job was going through in that amount of time from when it happened to when the friends showed up, it was showing on him. He had been going through hardness. And you know what really kills us? The why factor. Doesn't that kill you? Why did they do it? Why did this happen? Why did this take place? And when you don't know why, it drives us crazy. And he's gone through more than anybody's ever gone through outside of Jesus. And he has no idea why. His friends show up in a circle. You know, you usually can count in a circle group on one hand. It's not like, oh, I got 35 inner circle friends. You know what I'm saying? You might have 50 friends, but you might only have three that you can call any time, and they're really going to be true blue there for you. His inner circle three friends show up. I believe they meant well, but I believe they were influence of the devil. They sat with them for seven days. Can you imagine that? Seven days, not a word was said. When they showed up and saw Job and what he was going through, they just sat and no doubt wept with Job. Finally, the first friend mustered up the first opportunity, said, can we speak? It might be hard, but I want to say something. It was kind the way he introduced it. And now we got the dialogue. And what are they doing? They're blaming Job 
for the whole deal. Can you imagine your best friend showing up after weeks, after weeks that you buried your children, after weeks your wife hasn't spoken a word to you? He said, my breath is scarce to her. She won't even listen to me. Can you imagine? And what comes out of this inner circle, friends? Job, all this trouble you're in, it's your fault. Why are you playing us like a hypocrite? And they blame him for sin. And we go back to chapter 19. Look what he says in the opening chapter of this part, in the opening part of 19. Then Job answered and said, How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? His inner circle. He goes on to say, verse number 3, These ten times have you reproached me. You are not ashamed that you make yourself stranger, strange to me? He says, all you're doing is knocking and hitting and hurting me and you act like we're nobody. We're best friends. Did you, did you not come in to help me? You've done nothing for my grief. You've done nothing for my hurt. You know what Job needed? He needed a comforter, didn't he? We find, and I've preached already through, there's a part where you find Job saying what he would have said. There's a way you can handle people that go through grief. Sometimes you say nothing. Other times when you do talk, it's short, and it's the promises of God. These guys were doing nothing but just blaming Job. Yeah, the children's death, you. Your wife not speaking, you. Your servants dying, being murdered by people, you. Losing all your money, you. How do you think you would take that? He goes on to say these things. Notice in verse number 13. He has put my brethren far from me. My acquaintance are very estranged from me. My kinsfolk. We begin to see the earthly, listen to me, earthly relationships. You know what we find? They were unsatisfactory. You know what we find? They were insufficient. You know what we find? The inability in his friends. He said, my kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in my house and my maids, think about it. He was the leader. He was the, the king of this area. His own people in his own house, they count me for a stranger. After all I've done, after the time I've held their children, after I've helped them through their hardships, and all I've done for them now with what I'm going through, nobody wants to be there for me. Look what else he says. I am an alien in their sight. I called my servant, and he gave me no answer. Servants weren't just people that were nobody. This is what worked for him. The word servant in the Bible has a different mindset the way we think about it. He loves, they, they loved servants. It was like family. And he says, my, my servants and my all, they won't even answer me. Am I picking up on what he's going through? By the way, you think you got it bad. The man was a wrinkled face. Look what else he says. I called my servant, gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. Verse 17, probably the hardest thing he said. My breath is strange to my wife. She won't even listen to me. She won't even be there for me. He said this, I entreated her for the children's sake of my own body. He said, I've even gone to my wife and said, Honey, our children... You bore a part of me. He said, I came to her with that, saying, our children. And she won't even, won't even speak or listen to me. And we've buried the children without each other together. This is tough. He's looking at his inner circle. Where are you at? Why didn't they say, hey man, it's going to be okay. 
Where was that? The sun will rise again, the rain stops, clouds leave, storms exit, hang in there, don't give up, God's still good. Where was that? Anyone ever felt like that before? You ever been lonely? You know young people feel lonely too. You ever felt forsaken? He's naming all the relationships on earth. Think about it. They have nothing to do with me. Look at as he says. Verse 18, he says, Yea, young children despised me. I arose and spake against me. All my inward friends abhorred me. They whom I loved are turned against me. He can't take it. Look at verse 20. This is how his, his body's reacting to this. My bones cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh. And I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. I'm barely surviving here. I don't know how I'm alive. I know how I'm going to make it. And I think when he said that, he realizes he might even be near death. Now listen to me. He doesn't know why it's happened. He doesn't know what his friends are doing to him. He's confused. He's hurt. He's broken. He needs comfort. Look what it says next though. Have pity upon me. Have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do you persecute me as God and are not satisfied my flesh? Verse 23 to verse 27. One of the sweetest, most glorious... Did you know this? One of the greatest, glorious verses in all of your Bible is right here. I hope you don't miss this. See, there's something that Job does know. He begins to think about it and he says, I tell you what, I wish to God right now what I'm about to say everyone in the world will hear. Are you listening? He's talking to you. Job is preaching a message to you today. Oh, that my words were now written. Don't miss what I'm about to say. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. And what do you got to say, Job? For I know. I know. There's some things you can know. I want to preach with these points on what you and I can know when our flesh, don't miss it, please look, when our flesh fails us, when our family forsakes us, when our friendships are falling out, and you don't know why life is being this life, there's something you still can know. Number one, he says, let me tell you what I do know. I know my Redeemer. Amen right there. I know my Redeemer. There may be some failing relationships in his life, but there's an unfailing Redeemer. There may be some sorrow from his broken friendships, but there's a Savior who still knows him and still cares about him. He points out, I know one thing, I have my Redeemer. I want you to know today that there's still a God who knows you. It's hard to figure it out sometimes, but you can still know He knows. He's still on the throne. Amen. He still has it figured out. And Job can't get it. And Job is hurt. And you imagine what all he's been going through with these days. And his own wife won't even speak to him, be near him. He still says, I know this, I have my Redeemer. You know, sometimes look right here, and maybe somebody's going to have to go through it the next month. See, you don't find satisfaction in friendships and in spouses. You don't find satisfaction on the job, and you're going to find something that's empty in this life. The only one that brings you satisfaction, the only one that could comfort Job, not his friends, not his family, but his Redeemer. Amen. I know my Redeemer. I, 
look, there's many questions. Why did God let this happen? But I believe a sovereign, all-knowing God not only was showing off that Job was dedicated to him, but he was also going to use this moment in Job's life to help Job. He only needed him. You know who you need? Him. You don't need a party life. You don't need best buds. You don't need the newest fad here. You don't need a new job and promotion. And what I don't even have to live. But I've got to have him. I don't have to live. But I've got to have him. And he's all I need. Inability. Yep, they sure were. Hey, unsatisfactory. Absolutely they were. They could not do it. It was insufficiency. But with Jesus... It's guaranteed. I know my Redeemer. Number two, he knew that he liveth. He's alive. <laughs> you know what that means? That means Job knew it's going to work out. That's what he was powerfully stating when he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. I know it's going to work out. He's not dead. He's not gone. My children might be dead. My servants might be dead. My livestock might be dead. My riches may be gone. But my Redeemer liveth. And I know that it's going to work out. It's always going to work out. For all things work together for the good. And Job didn't understand it all. Living in this time frame of life. But deep down in Job's heart. And the pounding of his breast. He knew the God of heaven was alive. And that meant the God of heaven was going to make it work out. Amen. Oh, what do you hold on to in the dark moments? What do you hold on to? It better not be alcohol. It better not be some drug. It better not be a new exercise. It better not be a new job. It's not a new location. You can't move away from your problems. What you need is the Redeemer. He liveth. He liveth. And he'll work it out. I asked one time Dr. Vineyard, I said, Jim Vineyard, he's in heaven. I said, tell me, what does America need for revival? He said, two things. Read the Bible every day. We need to do that. And then he said, people need to put their hand up. And I was like, what's he doing? He's old, he's barely moving. He goes, put the hand up. And let God take it. <laughs> you know, your life would be a whole lot better if you just put your hand up and let God take it. My Redeemer, he liveth. My children are gone. You know how many families are built upon the child? I mean, there's a lot of couples, they get divorced once their children hit certain ages. Because it's like it's built upon the child. You know how many people are depending on a friend? You know how many people are depending upon some family member to be the stronghold? Let me tell you what you do. Put your hand up. And let God be the Redeemer that liveth. He said, I know this. <laughs> I know this. My Redeemer liveth. Number two, not only, not three, not only he liveth. Number three, it says he shall stand upon the earth. What does he mean by that? Job says, I know my Redeemer. And number two, he liveth. And number three, he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. You know, it makes a difference. When your eyes are fixed upon the Lord Jesus. This was a statement of his faith knowing that Jesus is coming. He didn't understand it all in that Old Testament, but he had been taught. He did his sacrifices. He knew the blood was important. He knew salvation was of the Lord God. He knew that the serpent's head was going to be bruised one day. And he knew that his Redeemer was going to come to this earth earth and he said I'm looking for that you know your answer listen every time you look in the scripture just about every time I gotta watch how I say that but many times when you read the Bible and it uses the word look looking like in Hebrews chapter 12 looking unto Jesus the word looking is in reference to our faith faith because we see we believe he said, I believe, I know my Redeemer, He's going to stand on this. He's looking for Him. 
You've got to have faith if you're going to make it through. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but let's, let's get real. Let's get real. War could come. Let's get real. Your child could die. Let's get real. Your best friend can go a different way and say, I never want to see you again. Let's get real. Divorces happen. Anybody listening? I know my Redeemer liveth, and He shall stand in the latter day on the earth. What is, where is your faith? If I took you to the rescue homes right now and showed you the down and outers that are popping pills and drinking booze and shooting themselves in the arm and if I took you down to halfway houses and took you to rescue homes, you know what you'd find? Look right here. I'm going to help you. You'll find people that had faith in something that would not last. And when they broke, they hit the bottom and they went searching for something to take away the pain that they were in. It will make a difference if our hope is not on something that vanishes, but our hope is on something that's permanent. And that's the eternal God Himself. I know my Redeemer liveth, and He shall stand in the latter day. Look what else He said. Not only He shall stand upon the earth, but number four, He says, In my flesh I shall see God. This is amazing that Job had some insight in this. He says in verse 26, And there after my skin worms destroy this body. He says, I'm going to die and I'm going to go to the dirt and worms are going to eat me up. But I know this. I know that even though I die and my body goes to this ground and my flesh gets overtaken, that I saw in my flesh, I will see God. He believed that one day he'd be resurrected. He'd be resurrected and he'd see face to face his Redeemer. That's good news. You know what that means? It's a big word for everybody in this room. This is a big word for every relationship. This is a big word for every broken heart, every broken dream. It means hope. Hope. Do you know how powerful hope is? Hope. That's why Ecclesiastes mentioned earlier, he said it's better to be a living dog than a dead lion because there's hope. He says, I know I'm going to die, but I will see the Lord, my Redeemer. You know what that gives us? Hope. <laughs> Who's thankful that this earth is not our final destination? Did you know when the problems of life, when the storm comes, when the sickness avails in the family, did you know the realization that this is not my final destination gives us hope? There is coming a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. Doesn't that give you hope? In the sweet by and by. He said, I will see God. The last thing I show you, notice how he ends it. He says, verse 27, Whom I shall see for myself. Now you got to think about this. He says, and mine eyes shall behold him and not another. What's he been talking about? How's everyone been treating him? Whew. Strange. He said, I've been a stranger to everybody that I've loved. People have abhorred me. They've turned their back on me. They won't listen to me. They treat me like strangers. I'm an alien in my own house. But when I meet my Redeemer, I'm not another. And He's not just another. There's no stranger with Him. I'm going to meet my 
Redeemer. You know how powerful it is to know that in Christ is satisfaction. The psalmist said in Psalm 17 that he would not be satisfied until he awakens in his likeness. Every one of us one day, you will have complete satisfaction. You will forever have every question answered. Have every doubt with an exclamation point fulfilled. And your faith will be sight. And when you awaken His likeness, I, I, I got a feeling that when we get to heaven, we won't care about this side anymore. Those that passed on our loved ones that are on the other side, they're not gazing over uh, some major uh, uh, balcony scene of heaven and consumed with what's happening down here. Are you kidding? They're on the eternal side. They live in forever. Sometimes I make the statement when I do funeral services, I say, that person, they, they, they are more alive now than they've ever been in their life. That's what Job's saying. Think about it again. I've become a stranger to the ones I love. But I know when I see him, I won't be strange. I know him and he knows me. Let's pray. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way. Preparing us a place in the sweet by and by. Heaven is sound and sweeter all the time. Seems like lately it's always on my mind. You might be here today and you feel empty. Broken. You know Jesus can help. If you don't know your Redeemer, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you know the Redeemer, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to get close to Him. And say like Job, I know my Redeemer liveth, and He shall stand. And I will see him. <laughs> what a testimony in such a hardship moment of Job's life. I want there to be somebody today that if you were to die right now, you don't think you'd be with God for all eternity. You know, you're going to go one or two places when you die. You'll go to heaven or hell. And if you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm telling you right now, you're miserable, you're lost, you are not knowing what life really is. I'm not going to embarrass you, but if you're here today and you're listening and if you were to die, you don't know if you'd go to heaven. You say, preacher, that's me. Something's missing. I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up right now? Slip it up so I can pray for you. Slip it up say, pray for me, preacher. Something's missing in my life. I've got an emptiness inside. I don't know if I died if I go to heaven. Pray for me, preacher. Anybody like that? Christian, is Jesus really everything he needs to be to you? He can be. See, some of you, you've been putting your hope on the wrong thing, haven't you? You think your friendships is what's really going to make it through. Nope. You think your family members is really what's going to get you through it. I'm here to tell you, nope. You think your parents, that's the key. I'm telling you, nope. But I'll tell you what will get you through. I know. My Redeemer liveth. I'm going to pray when I say amen. The piano will start playing and maybe somebody needs to come and just humble themselves before the Lord and say, I needed this, Lord. Thank you for being my Redeemer. And I'm not a stranger. <laughs> Lord, we love you. And we ask this in the most powerful name of Christ the Lord. Amen. Let's all stand up. The piano's playing. As God